Good. Okay, well, hello, uh, and thanks for attending Spokane Jewish Cultural Film Festival 2022, and today's Q&A with POPs director Lewis Rose. Uh, I'm Neil Schindler, the director of Spokane Area Jewish Family Services, which is the nonprofit that organizes the festival. Um, and uh, let's see, I will simply go ahead and introduce our guest today, Lewis Rose. He's a writer, director, and occasional actor. Um, his fiction work has screened around the world with his short The Chop, picking up 50 awards and screening at nearly 200 festivals. He's currently developed. Now, do you tell me if this is correct? It's uh, your bio said <laughs> you're currently developing your first feature with Bridgeway Films. Is that right? That's all correct. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, he also makes commercials and music videos for which he's won a UK music video award. His favorite color is purple. He walks like a penguin <laughs> and he makes delicious sour pickles. So welcome. Uh, Lewis Rose to Spokane Jewish Cultural Film Festival 2022. Thank you. Thanks for having me in the film. Absolutely. Uh, we're really pleased to have uh, the film and it's wonderful to speak with you. I wanted to start out with this, a, a question that's probably not that unusual, but I'm still interested to know. Um, what exactly inspired this story? And another common question, was there any sort of autobiographical element in it for you? Um, in terms of the inspiration for the story, uh, there is something in my family where one of our relatives, they wanted to have quite an unusual funeral mm. and um, and they tried to do it and they couldn't um, for various reasons. And and in, in real life, there was no sort of conflict in the family about it, but mm. I thought it would be ripe, you know, especially taking into account the kind of, um, you know, the ideas about assimilation and how different mm. people connect to the religion uh having a sibling rivalry might be a really interesting way to explore that um so that was sort of the starting point and then when it came to the actual sending into space um i i was kind of trying to figure out what the right funeral was at one point mm. I th you had a couple of different ideas and then online i saw an advertisement for a company who actually send uh people into space as, as a send-off they send ashes into space and they, mm. they uh, they're an amazing company they're called sent into space and they actually ended up coming on board with the film to help with those elements um mm -hmm. they also do a lot of commercial work so you know a brand like um i don't know uh you know um pen and jerry's have sent an ice cream into into the atmosphere and things <laughs> like that so oh, they're, wow. they're a cool company and so i saw someone who'd actually had a a, a friend of a friend on facebook had posted um that they had had this kind of funeral and uh, I just thought it was the perfect you know setting for the film because mm. it's got that real you know it it just went to the heart of you know sort of down in the ground with you know sort of tradition and history versus up in the ether um mm -hmm. with the fairies almost so you know it was it was a really nice uh and you know I there was something very visual about it and um a little bit off the wall which i quite like in my films so that was that was sort of uh where the main plots of the story came from and then i developed it with my producers bridgeway films as lou morissette to kind of mm. um hit those beats of the story and see how we could how we could turn it into a short so you know autobiographical wise it, it obviously mm. has some connections to my family but thematically i guess sort of the two characters the brother and the sister where they sit I kind of see my own Jewishness as somewhere in between the two um mm -hmm. and I guess that you know that they maybe feel like almost like poles of my personality some in some ways I sort of feel quite uh I, you know free-spirited and I'm not particularly religious but then there's also part of me that really values the tradition and, and it's an important part of my identity so yeah it's, it's definitely a personal film but um and has some autobiographical elements I hadn't it's funny i had thought about that tension between uh tradition and sort of um newer or different ways of being jewish uh practicing you know jewish tradition or diverging from it but i hadn't actually thought of the two i mean the two characters now it seems obvious of course that they themselves represent that push and pull i mean they're in conflict um but yeah i thought of it more in terms of the ideas that they were uh, attached to right but of course they themselves yeah. are uh, as well. Um, so this actually leads very nicely into the next question I had, which is obviously, you know, traditionally in Judaism, cremation is not allowed. At the same time, I, I don't know how many, I haven't read the statistics, but I, I think many Jews contempor contem in contemporary times are choosing cremation for one way or another. And that may 
restrict them from burial in some places, but not in others. Um, how much, how did you decide how much or how little to address the issue of cremation as sort of taboo in Jewish tradition? And I would add sort of knowing that some of your viewers certainly wouldn't be Jewish and they wouldn't necessarily know that, right? So how, how do you decide how explicit to be in addressing that? I think in the script originally, there was, it was sort of pointed to a lot more and mm. we kind of stripped back a bit, partly because we didn't want to kind of dumb down to an audience. And I've noticed when I watch films that are culturally specific, you always enjoy them a lot more if you feel that they're sort of made more with the audience who they're about in mind and they don't have to explain everything about the religion. So I think, I can't remember how much actually went into the final film. There's definitely a line where he says creation is forbidden, but I think it happens when we're like downstairs with the rabbi and you just hear it in the background. So mm. um, I kind of left it out partly due to time and also just not wanting to be overly expositional, but it, it was definitely something to think about. And, you know, from a Jewish perspective, a lot of people would say that, the final result didn't really please either of them in a way because you know he was cremated and I guess I suppose Roz kind of gets her way but yeah I think it's kind of that's that's sort of the irony of the thing you know it's the same thing as they have with with the five pound note in their in their life is kind of um these things aren't always perfect and um you know, these traditions, I mean, I think the cremation tradition is, you know, I think it is a tradition more than scripture, right? From when I looked into it, there was, a re you know, there was a precedent for cremation long, long, long ago in early Jewish history. Um, so I guess these things do go full circle to an extent. And unless it's, you know, li literally written in black and white in the Torah, mm -hmm. there are always people who are going to, even some of that stuff, you know, we have to move away from. So <laughs> plenty yeah. of it, in fact. So I think sure. there's always going to be that that push and pull. And I guess that's kind of what the film is examining is, is that, um, you know, uh, how assimilation and us trying to move with modern times come brings things into conflict like that, you know? Mm -hmm. I also found it interesting with, with Roz, the character of Roz. Um, I am aware of, because I wrote an article about this many years ago, I'm aware of the, over the years, the increasing uh, pull for a lot of Jews, at least I think this might've been focused on America, but I think it's not just American Jews, um, pull towards sort of Eastern spirituality, often because, not always, but often because in their own Jewish education, they got certain things like they were taught Hebrew, they were taught history, but they didn't get that spiritual piece either at all really, or to the extent that would have been helpful to them. And so that there's a hole there. And, you know, in this particular case, when I wrote about it, it was Buddhism, but I found that interesting too. It's not just that Raz has a different path. It's that it, for me at least, echoes a pretty common contemporary um, interest among, you know, Jews who don't fully identify or even largely identify as religiously Jewish, right? Yeah, I'd never thought of it from that perspective, but I think you're right. And and there is, I feel like in, you know, in a lot of the experience of Jewish people of how they're brought up Jewish, a lot of it is on the practice and the, um, you know, the, the routine, you know, they, if you talk about what is like a halachic or, or a, a living in an orthodox way, it is to live, live as an orthodox Jew. And actually the sort of spirituality, although it's embedded, you have to, um, you have to work a lot more it's a lot on you whereas you know in something like buddhism you know this the spiritual element meditation is, is i guess baked in a lot more um and so i do see the you know i do think that a lot of people probably and that's kind of where i saw rose is coming from kind of saw their jewish upbringing as more of like a rules and barriers as opposed to mm -hmm. anything that like speaks to them on a, on a deeper sense and i i know that you can get that and i've had it from judaism but i think for a lot of people as I say, I think you have to work harder. And, and for me, a lot of it comes from the echoes of what have gone before, you know, and, and Ellie sort of represents that of, you know, wanting to keep keep on that tradition. For him, that is spiritual, but it's not for everyone, you know? Right, right. Yeah, that's um, an interesting point. But so our, our, our guest, our attendee here uh, on the Zoom is actually my mom, so um, Rosalind Schindler, and she says many Jews are now moving toward green burial at one with the earth as is part of Jewish tradition, in fact. So there are a lot of interpretations that are emerging or have emerged 
that are pretty different from what a generation, and especially two generations ago, would have considered okay, right, or proper, yeah. or or however you want to kosher, I don't know, however you want to think of it. Um, I want to ask, is, were there particular things about British Jews versus Jews in other parts of the world that you were hoping to capture in the film? Yes, yeah, certainly the community that they live in, uh, it is quite a specific community. And I think as well, there's something about the British Jewish mentality, which I feel is quite different from American Jewish, in that British Jews have always been a, have been a lot more um, sort of secretive about their identity. It's less out in the open. Obviously, mm. in the US, co Jewish culture has been a huge part of the kind of American cultural landscape from mm. the 20s or even before, if you go back to vaudeville, mm. um, and obviously through the history of Hollywood and comedy and everything else. And in the UK, it's just, it, there's very little Jewish knowledge among the population, you know, mm. as cultural touchstones. You know, you look how popular Seinfeld was in the States as such a Jewish show. It, it's so I think the difference is that Jews in the UK are much more yeah, private about their Judaism. And um, and that's something I wanted to kind of capture, I guess, with the clash between the siblings as well. You know, that mm. they um, they both come from a certain place and, and Rose has maybe moved away. She's almost, you know, there's kind of like a little bit of, I don't know if she's ashamed of her Jewishness, but it certainly mm. doesn't speak to her. Um, so yeah, there's, I even if they didn't, there's nothing that sort of, directly hits that note in the story in terms of the world I was representing mm. in most of my films you know the previous one the chop and the feature I'm writing they're set in kind of Jewish London mm. and it's because I don't see it represented that much and I think it is very different to what people do see represent in terms of representation of Jews on the screen which is mainly sort of American Jewish culture and Israeli Jewish culture mm -hmm. right um, so certainly for a UK audience anyway, I'm interested to sort of share it with people and, uh, you know, to events and festivals like this for other Jews around the world to, to get a sense of a different community. Yeah, and I have to say, um, even though even though they are by and large English language, I don't know that we've screened many British films over. We've had a festival now for 18 years. And I so I was very pleased to include a British film, it's something that certainly want to do more of and you know <laughs> at, at such time as your feature is complete we'd be interested in in looking at that as well of course but yeah. um, so how was making pops different from making the other short films what are some ways in which it was unique or different uh from the other projects you've done so far um i guess it was it was a large operation in terms of the number of days shooting mm. and then we had this sort of big set piece at the end um with the the balloon so there was quite a lot of action elements it was it was it was definitely the biggest production i've done so far um and i think as well what was at the heart of it it was much more dramatic than mm. my, my previous shot was more of a straight comedy and this i'd say ah. is more of a drama with some comedic elements so sort of balancing that tone and you know I think in some places it worked some places it didn't but it was kind of a learning curve for me my my feature is in a similar space in terms of tone so you know it's kind of learning that and, and seeing how I can kind of make the two work together so that was probably the biggest challenge was was and the biggest difference was mm. kind of trying to sort of handle drama my instinct is usually towards comedy <laughs> and most of my stuff ends up having like a comic uh, bent to it so it was it was sort of trying to make sure that the drama came through with with emotion and the comedy didn't feel out of place you know mm -hmm. yeah and i mean i think for some viewers at least uh making a, a film with jewish themes and having little to no comedy would or humor i guess i would say would be like having a jewish gathering without food Although unfortunately, unfortunately during COVID, that's become a reality, yeah. bad reality. But yeah, no, I think uh, humor is definitely a way that, in general, audiences connect to films, of course. But it, particularly, I think in Jewish film festivals, I, I as the organizer of the festival, am always desperate. I mean, desperate is not too strong a word. I'm desperate to find films that aren't just real sad, you know, because you've got a slew every year of Holocaust films, and then you've got a slew of Israel Palestine films and you've got other sad films and it just we need to have something that's not straight drama and tragedy really and that was another reason we were very glad to include your film because it's you know it's not a heavy film 
at the same time, it touches on some serious themes and topics. And your comment before about the tone kind of anticipated one of my next questions, which is, you know, you, you set yourself a real challenge in maintaining that tone that's kind of delicately balanced between comedy and drama. And, you know, it seems like that's something that um, uh, emerged fairly naturally. Like, I don't know if you had a very clear idea of what that would mean in the final results when you started, or if you kind of came came to it over the course of making it. I don't know which it was. I think it was it was a mix of things. So I had, you know, I think the first draft was less comedic and then I tried to inject some more comedy, partly for our, you know, from some feedback we had and things mm. like that. Um, and actually in the end, all of the additional comedy stuff I shot, we ended up taking out of the edit because it just, mm. you know, we had some cuts that were more comedic and they didn't quite feel right or they felt like they undermined the drama a little bit. So. Mm. It was definitely a balance and I think I've learned a lot from it in terms of the next film of, of knowing how how to structure it and where those comedic elements come from. Mm. Um, sometimes if you try and shoehorn in jokes just to, you know, <coughs> almost make it feel like, oh, well, don't worry, this isn't all sad and you sort of have like a bit of a, a kind of uh, a tacked on one liner or something. Mm. It doesn't feel, yeah, it doesn't feel... Uh, natural and I think you know I guess this is always the rule with comedy it needs to be mm. born out of the characters and their situation mm -hmm. and I think the points at which the comedy does land is when it's driven by a character more than anything else in the film. Mm -hmm. um, my mom adds yes films that focus on the whole of Jewish life philosophy values etc contemporary or historical are important right um, sure. so I feel like the film, and you may feel similarly, it really wouldn't have worked nearly as well without your two leads, because it's on the strength of their performances that we get the emotional depth, right, that really, by the end, it's a 20 minute film, yeah, but at the end, a lot has happened emotionally for the characters, and I think for the audience, at least for in my case, um, and I'd love to hear how you cast the two, your two leads. Yeah, they were incredible, and as you say, I think, you know, as is always the way the film would be nothing without them, but on, especially in something like this, where mm -hmm. it was so emotionally uh, taxing and they really had to show that journey and not the ending where they kind of come together had to be, we had to sort of buy it and really feel their desperation. You know, I, I think we were so lucky that they came on board. They're both, you know, pretty reputable actors here. Sam, Samantha mm -hmm. Spiro, who plays Roz, is in Sex Education, in the, the Netflix show along with some other big things. Nigel Lindsay is a big comedy actor here who's mm. been in some big films like uh, Four Lions and lots of other big productions. So that was another, you know, in terms of my process, they, they were certainly the, the most well-known actors I'd worked with. So it was just really, you know, humbling, but interesting to see their process and see how they, um, what they need from a director and how they can take the script and make it their own. Mm. Um, they had a lot to do you know and, and again because it's sort of a tonal balance as well they had to read between those lines and they both have comedy experience which is great um they've been in you know uh at least 50 percent of their work is comedy so that definitely helped um but yeah it was amazing they really uh they were wonderful to work with and they really made the film <laughs> thanks uh, welcome to judy who just joined us um how did you decide on the dream sequence? Um, and I actually, from a, just a, a practical standpoint, I'm interested to know how you got the effect of the ashes coming out of the astronaut's helmet. But I'm, I'm also interested to know sort of what, how that, how you decided on that as a, as a thing to include. Yeah, I feel like it's quite a strange thing to include. And part <laughs> of me was humming and hawing because it's, it's sort of out of keeping with some of the rest of the film. Mm. And it's also, uh, it's quite a strange scene um, and it's not essential for the story. You could have it not that element in the story and it, it would still work. It but, almost um, feels like horror in moments, you know? Yeah, and, and there was just, uh, it was kind of, you know, I guess with short films, they are partly experimentation. You know, you want them to be a piece of themselves, but you're also testing yourself. And it was something that came into my head while I was writing it and the imagery of it I found really interesting. And the film is very visual at the end of the film with the balloon, but, you know, a lot of it is set in people's houses and discussions. So I also just wanted something that um, 
they showed what they were going through in a cinematic way as opposed to just through conversation and conflict mm -hmm. so yeah I, I yeah. you know I still I think it's the kind of scene where some people it's their favorite thing and other people <laughs> they don't quite know what it's doing in there um mm -hmm. which is which is fine I, I think especially with short films you know um that's sort of the kind of stuff you have to try out um mm -hmm. in terms of how we did it um our production designer may davis who's uh brilliant she we she had three or four different methods of uh of things that could be ash that could come out um she had like uh she had some black sand which didn't quite show up and then we settled on this you know like if you get um foam like in a pelly case or that kind of thing like uh yeah you know that, that sort of uh yeah black gray grayish black foam she cut that up arduously into tiny little pieces <laughs> grated it maybe i'm not quite sure um and we shoved all of that in the helmet and then we actually had uh one of our production assistants harrison toward who was in he was our space man and we had this it, the, the helmet didn't actually lift up very cleanly so he was like sweating trying with these like Clunk, clunky astronaut hands to sort of move it up and yeah it was definitely like a little bit of fiddling and obviously on set you know time is massively at a premium so it just like there were a few times where we were like what are we doing <laughs> but yeah I was pleased with the result you know yeah we got the shot with some fiddling well I'm in the category who appreciated it I think it adds both a little bit of surrealism and also um it just there's already a sense of like kind of a cosmic feel to because I mean largely because of Roz's you know influence on the whole uh, proceedings. But yeah, no, I, I think it I think it works fine. Um, well, <laughs> I would say. yeah. Um, and, okay. and that was actually not, that was actually another reason for it that you kind of touched on was that it is a film about space and mm -hmm. this kind of cosmic element. And you're right that there was you know other than the drawings, we don't really get that anywhere maybe you get it at the end obviously but right yeah so i think it was just threading that through and and trying to create a feeling of of yeah what you know soul might have had in his head or just yeah just bring some of that into the world a little bit i'm guessing that the final footage over the credits of the space funeral itself came from the company that you were talking about is that that's footage that they had i of an actual space funeral or was it no they they so they came on board and they did a real launch for us so the launch that you see at the end of the film with the balloon mm -hmm. they came that day what, during the shoot to sort of do all of the elements of the balloon and everything else and then after that on a separate day they did a launch they do their launches up in the north of england so they went off on their own and did this launch for us and you know uh set up a mechanism so that when the balloon popped the box flipped and they had wires that pulled the lid off the box and stuff when the balloon popped it pulled the wires so they worked to create you know something that would achieve what we were hoping mm. and then they sent me this footage and they said see what you think and i just sat there it was you know awesome like sat in my flat and for about an hour and a half because it takes a mm. long time to go up i just watched yeah. this balloon go up uh. from the bottom not knowing when it was going to pop either there was something oh, wow. really like i don't know just uh, it's such a weird thing to 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 see so i just kind of wanted to drink it in and, and watch the full journey up you know um mm -hmm. so yeah that was that was really cool it's mesmerizing even the short amount that you include it just you know i think in part because you don't know when it's going to happen but also just because it's just not something that we see much right unless we looked this up online on youtube or something we i didn't have occasion to see that before yeah so it was neat uh, to kind of have that experience as well um okay well another probably overused question but I, I can't help it if you can if you are able to tell us a little about your feature i would be interested to hear about it yeah so my feature is um it's another comedy drama and mm -hmm. it's actually working with similar characters they're both called rosanelli slightly younger in this film mm -hmm. but uh it's working with similar characters that's at stake in the short it's not an adaptation but i kind mm -hmm. of felt those characters had a lot left to give sort of thing and in the story it's about uh a father who dies but in this story he is um he's a kind of jewish scholar who uh has this and this jewish bookshop and judaica shop in the synagogue grounds and our, and the film is set a year after his death and the daughter mm. Roz comes home for the father's stone setting 
and she finds out that the mother has not been doing too well since the father's death. So she's kind of convinced by her brother, Ellie, who's sick of bur burdening the, the family mm -hmm. burden to, to stay. And when she does stay, she discovers in his basement a, a statue of a golem. Um, and uh, the film is about how she uses, the mum becomes obsessed with the golem and the daughter mm -hmm. uses this golem as a way to try and rekindle her relationship with her mum but she inadvertently tricks her mum into believing that the golem has divine powers um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that, that's the that's the kind of outline of the film <laughs> you've got a golem poster behind I you do, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> golems well i don't know if you, you saw the it was a couple of years ago the horror film about a golem. i think it was about I a golem. see it but i know of it yeah it i haven't kind of seen it either but I um I the golem I, golem golems are, are kind of getting i don't know they're having a, a moment it's a long moment it's been kind of but um they're they're a fascinating thing to to work with whether it's actually a supernatural element or just sort of the the image of, of one i think that there's a lot of power in that for yeah not just because it's old but also because i don't know there's kind of a strength and a fearsomeness that you don't necessarily see portrayed in a lot of Jewish themed film, but it comes from so long ago that, that that's mm -hmm. something that, you know, uh, is part of the tradition too. So that it's an interesting choice. Yeah, and I just find that when you playing with these kind of myths, I, I mean, I find the myth fascinating and I think playing with the myth that gives you something interesting to play into. And, you know, you say there is a resurgence and I think there definitely is within sort of Jewish, uh, you know, Jewish art and Jewish, you know, um, uh storytelling maybe but i think most people who i've spoken to who aren't jewish don't have not heard of the golem right. um so i and i think it's you know in terms of what the ultimate aim is which is you know for these films to be appealing to a jewish community but to a wider audience i think there's something much there's something about myths particularly mm. you know a myth that they don't know about that instantly hooks people you know and i when i say when I tell that part and I say, you know, it's this mythical creature made of clay and people, you know, they kind of lean forward in their seat because there is something that, um, yeah, I think there's just something that uh, is a bit more um, uh, vibrant about it and, and that, you know, speak, I guess it also, you imagine that most myths of a, of a cultural group go to the heart of who that group are. And for me, certainly, I think the Golem is, is a creation story creation that couldn't come from any other group you know um any other people i think especially when you look at stories like the Golem of prague and what it's created out of i think it's a very you know very much goes to kind of the the if we have a national uh, mentality you know a jewish mentality sort of thing i feel like it it goes to the heart of what makes us you know a, a sort of historical fabric if you know what i mean mm. um mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I just want, I knew I wanted to make something about the golem that kind of transposed the story into a modern Jewish context. Um, I wanted to kind of avoid, I mean, there are elements where it's sort of, you don't know whether it's supernatural or, or like think strange things kind of happening, mm. but rather than going full supernatural or horror, it's not sort of my style. So it was kind of how, yeah, I guess playing it more in a, in a high concept kind mm. of way of like, you know, uh, a farce essentially, but um, you know, how can I how can I use it and, and turn it into a farce? Well, I certainly look forward to to seeing it when it's uh, available to to view. Yeah, we're you know it's still the script stage, so it's early days ah, in terms of production. Okay. But um, soon as you know it's ready, I'll I'll let you know. Please, please, and you know that was more or less all I had to to ask. Um, is there anything else that we haven't touched on uh, regarding pops or uh, your work in general that you think it would be interesting for our festival goers to know? Um, no, I mean, I, I you know, like I say, I think what I'm trying to do in, in my films is show the Jewish world I grew up in, and hopefully, there's you know something interesting in that North London Jewish world, which like any diaspora Jewish community is very uh, varied and um, has uh, people with all sorts of different levels of Jewishness. So that was kind of what I was trying to capture. And, you know, I just want to send huge thanks to everybody involved in the film, or my incredible cast and crew who, who made it a reality um, and who, you know, it was a long process. We shot it in the height of COVID 
was not an easy film oh, to wow. make. And then the, <laughs> um, you know, the the production we, we originally met you before COVID, you know, it's a long drawn out production for various reasons and everyone's dedication and, and talent was really mm. incredible. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very humbling that they, you know, everybody was involved to, to make this film a, a, a reality. Thanks for mentioning that you made it during COVID. I feel like these days when a film is relatively new, I can't help but wonder, right? And it, it does it does affect, how, you know, how you think of it in or how a person would think of it just because of the challenges that are inherent in that. So uh, that's certainly good to know. My, my mother has her hand, her virtual hand raised. So would you like to make a comment or ask a question? Um, <clears throat> I would, thank you. Um, uh, First of all, thank you for doing all you do and uh, for bringing, uh, bringing that short film uh, to light. I have two questions. One is a little bit humorous, I suppose, because you probably noticed from my name, I'm ac I actually am known as Roz. And so uh, yeah. I'm, wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering what what drew you to the particular names that you chose. Mm -hmm. That's the first question. And the second one uh, has to do with the feature film. Um, you mentioned that um, Roz returns to, if I understood you correctly, she returns uh, a year after for the stone setting for her dad and so forth. Um, do you, uh, in as much as uh, an, an, an unveiling is not, you know, mm -hmm part of, of halakha, it's uh, become tradition among Jews. Um, is it something that you will include in terms of the actual uh, unveiling ceremony, the, the, the ritual that takes place and so forth and so on? That's the second question. Yeah, um, well, uh, yeah, on the name question, it was, was just, it was a name I was hmm. drawn to. I'm not sure how it came back. It was from a very early draft in the script. I think when I, when I, come up with names you know for a Jewish film for instance I will think of all the Jewish people I know <laughs> and you know just run through names in my head and see what feels right and uh -huh. there's not you know an exact science to it but I have spent sure. probably procrastinating but I have spent <laughs> afternoons trying to come up with the right name for a character that you mm. know nothing quite feels uh -huh. right yeah. Um, mm. and yeah something about Roz I think the spelling of it as well and in the script it's spelled R-O-Z and there was just something a little bit sort of uh I don't know you know untraditional about that which maybe mm. felt right and um and also you know there's also like practical elements like in a script you ideally don't want two major characters with the same first letter as their name mm. uh purely from a reading sense as someone's reading the script it can get quite confusing over you know uh just mentally it's more work for the reader to do so by and large, and, and again, names sound very similar, you know, uh, even like you wouldn't want your team, I mean, you could do, but two name characters, Tom and Jim, it, you kind of mm. you want a bit of contrast there. So Ros and Ellie, they were well contrasted names and just two that I was sort of drawn to. Um, and in terms of the feature question, I didn't I didn't know that the unveiling wasn't Khalaha. I mean, I, I kind of, yeah, I guess it makes sense that it's tradition rather than, you know, um, something you know uh set in stone part yeah. of the <laughs> uh, well done well done <laughs> um but i i mean i found it you know it's obviously very visual for the film and it's also a nice point mm. in terms of Roz being a character in the story who has come from not being present with the family um and she arrives at the stone setting late for various reasons she rushed up there and the last thing that she has to the first thing she has to do rather at the end of the ceremony is with her brother and her mother take this black cloth and, and remove mm. it there felt something like very symbolic about that and that spoke a lot about um you know her having to come back to the family and, and be involved in these traditions and sort of step up uh, which is kind of what the theme is you know sort of a different theme to the short where it's i mean it shares a lot thematically but in the short it's more of a kind of conflict between the two of them and and more about you know how you honor someone who different people have a different opinion on um and that you know and someone's there's more important things than than honoring someone's wishes because you can honor them in a greater sense you know hmm. um whereas this the kind of more specific thing that's at stake is will she sort of step up and be there for her mom and and, and um 
and that kind of transition from being her parents' child to her parents' carer, that's sort of what mm. it's it's grappling with. So it's quite, yeah, it's a different sort of through line. And usually a feature in a short will have, because there's much more space in a feature, but that's the thing that's driving it. So it felt like the three of them removing the cloth together in the kind of the second scene felt like quite a potent thing to do. Mm. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing it also when it becomes available. I look forward to sharing it and making it. <laughs> do that first. Judy, I've seen you unmute yourself a few times. Do you have a question or comment before we wrap I, up? I do have a question. Um, and if you've already addressed it, I apologize for being late. I know that in making a film, editing takes a long time and often things are cut out. And I was a little more interested in seeing more of the transformation of the son's acceptance of mm. the father's wishes. And I wondered if you could speak to that and maybe uh, in real life or, or what was cut out, uh, things that you had to leave out in general from the movie. Thanks. Mm. Thanks for the question. Um, I guess in, in terms of his transition, it's a difficult thing to do because he has been so dogmatic throughout. And I guess <clears throat> we didn't actually have much additional stuff there. There was maybe like one or two extra lines in that final scene that we cut out, mm -hmm. but nothing significant. And my feet, my thinking of where he his character had gone was that by the end, once he finds out that his father's been cremated, He's not really thinking straight, you know, it, like the damage has already been done in a way. So his his impetus at the end is more out of principle and a sort of, you know, the madness of grief, I suppose, uh, which is driving him to do that. So at that last point when he lets go, mm. I think it's, it's when Ross says she's sorry, you know, you've been having an argument with someone you know and if that person backs down uh, it, or even you know i find if you go to another room and come back a few minutes later once one person's come down or put out the olive branch you can just diffuse things in a second yeah. and i know this is a bigger thing but he was kind of in a wild state and when she sort of says sorry and 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 they you know that this is the last thing the dad would want them to do it's almost like they both by that point they both want to do the thing that's going to make the other one happy you know um so Russ says, bring it down, he lets it go. They sort of realized that it's not worth it. So that was kind of my thinking there, but there were things that we cut out. Um, you know, some of them were conversational elements. Um, there was a couple of small scenes that we cut out. So there was one scene when straight after the solicitors, before they go into the house, they had a discussion in the car, which is, you know, but it, it felt extraneous. And there were a couple of other small scenes like that. Looking back at it, I wonder whether there may be even a couple of more trims that we could have done. But, you know, hindsight, it's it's very difficult. And like you said, Judy, the editing process is quite arduous and, and quite intense. And it's very hard to get perspective at that time. So you've just got to, you know, you're just always learning. And I, I spent a lot of my career as an editor. So it's, mm. certain, it's not something I'm unfamiliar with, but still it's it's just it's the hardest thing is to get perspective and decide how much you need to tell the audience when is the right time to come out of the scene um but i had a wonderful editor uh jan schroeder who i worked with and it was it was a lot of fun doing it together and you know i think you can always look back and say maybe we take up more of this or maybe actually some of the stuff we took out might have been interesting we had a scene that started the film that was very fast paced it kind of like it didn't quite like a, almost like a montage of different of like Ros smoking and Ellie tapping and then the far you actually see the father sort of take his last breath mm. but there was something that felt it didn't quite fit tonally so yeah it's lots of tough decisions and you never quite know what you get right but you have to make you have to make peace with it at some point mm -hmm. well Lewis, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us this evening for you and afternoon for us. And I, I will say, you know, I really enjoyed the film and we, we appreciated having it in our festival so prominently uh, at, the, at the beginning. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much for screening it and for tonight as well. Honestly, really, um, yeah, amazing questions that really made me think about it. And it was a really interesting chat. So yeah, thanks for having me.
Very good. All right. Take care. And I'm sure we'll see you again uh, before too long. All right. Take care. Bye.